Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. I'm Bob, how's it going? Welcome to another 2022 ski comparison. This is a fun one because we've never done this category as a comparison. Yeah, and just a side note, we even have some 2023 skis here too. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so it's not really a 2022 comparison. It's a hybrid multi-year comparison. Um, in the last comparison, and I believe in last Top 5 Fridays too, we asked you guys what we haven't done that you would like to see. This was the overwhelming response. Um, a couple of people are asking about twin tips too, so maybe we'll try and work that in in the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, you guys really wanted us to do touring skis, um, and it was a fun wall to put together. Yep. Um, something that we wanted to focus on on this wall, and I thought we would address this right away because it will probably come up in your questions if we didn't. Um, if we included a ski in another comparison video, it is not up here. Right. Um, so I don't know if that feels obvious or not, <laughs> um, but you know, skis like the Blaze, skis like the Head Cores. Yeah. We've talked about a lot of skis that are appropriate to pair with a touring binding, and you won't necessarily see them up here. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's. That's a good way to go. I mean, we could say where we would put a Ripstick 106 yep. or a Blaze 94 or something like that. But yeah, you know, these are all, you know, part of whichever brand's marketing department as touring, backcountry or alpine touring, whatever, whatever yep. you want to call it. Uh, they're in that part of the catalog. Yep. So we're adhering to that. Yep, exactly. Um, so... Yeah, pretty cool group of skis. We also brought some bindings. We just brought four different touring bindings. Um, so as we can go through, we can kind of talk a little bit about maybe which one of these bindings you might pair with one of these skis. Yep. Um, we have the Solomon Pure Mountain all the way up to the Duke PT-16. And there's like a 2,000 gram difference between those <laughs> yeah. two bindings, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's pretty so stark. A pretty, pretty big contrast. Um, and even before we get into skis, you know, I would say that there aren't even too many skis up here that you'd probably pair with that, that heavy Duke PT-16. Yeah. You know, it's really those skis over on that end of the wall, which we'll get to. We are going to go lightest to heaviest, if you hadn't picked up on that already. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll touch on those bindings as we go through. And, Bob, you want to get us started off with this Dina Star? Sure. And there's a, there's a handful of skis on this wall that either share a name or some type of mold with their Alpine counterparts. Uh, this is the M Tor 99. So the Alpine counterpart would be the M Pro 99 from Dina Star. And they do share a very similar mold. Uh, they get this one pretty pretty far down in the weight, 1265 here in the 178. Uh, so that's a pretty stark difference from the Alpine version. Uh, they do that using a Polonia wood core, and then similar to their M-Pro line and the M-Free line, they use their hybrid uh, polyurethane technology on the side. So it gives a pretty unique feel, and I think both of us were somewhat surprised when this ski ended up on the light side of the wall I kind of felt like there were some other really more touring oriented skis that this had more, uh, you know, a little bit more heft to it, but certainly not. Pretty light, yeah. you know, and they do a good job getting the stiffness in there as well. Um, I would say that this one airs more on kind of the burly side for how light it is, uh, especially compared to some of the other skis. We do have basalt fiber in here as well, um, which is used in a lot of cross country skis. So it does have that lightening uh, lightning way about it. Um, you'll hear us say this a lot. A lot of these touring skis, when they depart from their Alpine uh, family, they kind of shorten up the rocker, especially in the tail. Uh, and that's to give the skin a better chance to optimize your climbing efficiency. Uh, tip rocker is pretty much the same as in the M Pro. Uh, pretty long, some moderate splay here. So it's going to be a really nice floater at 99 uh, and just a really good really good option um, especially for that lighter that lighter more tech oriented binding yeah i think like i personally wouldn't go to a shift right. on a ski like this if i feel like at that point you're adding an unnecessary amount of weight not to say that you couldn't yeah and i'll speak to that on the next ski because i like exactly contradict myself with my own <laughs> setup on the next ski that we're going to talk about um, you mentioned flatter tails and the, the more efficient 
climbing that you get from them. Yep. I think there's also something to be said about flatter tails in a backcountry ski yep. on the way down too. You know, I think like when when us as skiers we think about touring and we think about backcountry skiing, I think it's really like natural to picture like perfect snow conditions and like just making like awesome powder turns. Yeah. But realistically a lot of situations in the backcountry you need like a lot of edge grip so you don't slip off a cliff and die. Yeah. Um, and having <laughs> having a flatter tail, you know, it gives you a little bit more confidence if you're in a really sketchy situation or really demanding terrain. Yeah. Like no fall zone type of situations, having a ton of tail rocker might not be what you want. Yeah. And while this one is more closely mirrored the M Pro, the Alpine counterpart part, something like that Black Crow's Camex Freebird is different. Yes. You know, the regular Camex has more of that turned up tail, which might not be the best for that touring application, but in this uh, Camex Freebird, we do see the slight change there. Yep. Um, next ski we got up here is the Blizzard Zero G 95. Uh, these things use what Blizzard calls Carbon Drive 2.0, so pretty lightweight wood core in here, and then a really cool application of carbon, and it's kind of, the carbon is, is curved yeah. into a, a three-dimensional application. Um, we've talked about what happens to carbon when you put it in a three-dimensional application before, um, and, and you just get a stronger ski, you know, a little bit less pingy. Um, I would say that that describes this ski really, really well. It is incredibly stiff, <laughs> um, coming in right around 1,280 grams. Um, something that I think is interesting about this ski, uh, and I, I feel like feel like you see it more often in this category, um, with some exceptions certainly that we'll we'll look at throughout here. Um, but it's got a pretty long turn radius. Yeah. Um, this ski, this is the 178. And it has a 20, 20, 22 meter turn radius. I which believe the 185 even goes up to like 24 yeah. or 25, yeah. Um, which, yeah, is pretty long. The benefit to that, you know, this is a very efficient ski for the uphill. We looked at the weight, sub 1300 grams. That's going to feel pretty darn efficient for the uphill. With that stiffness and the long turn radius, it's a pretty fun ski on the descent, too. And you get this blend of like willingness to make a big arcing turn. But then with a longer turn radius, it also allows you to release your tail edge more easily. Yeah, I think that's kind of a hidden benefit of these touring skis, yeah, is exactly. that longer turn shape. Yeah. Um, I said I contradicted myself because I have a pair of these in my quiver right now, um, and I put the shift binding on it. Mostly just personal preference about bindings. I'm willing to have a few extra 100 grams on each foot um, just for a heavier binding. You know, we, we live in northern Vermont, so there's a limit to the length of our tours. Right. You know, if I was out west and I was doing more like long hut-to-hut -hut style tours or, or multi-runs multi, multi runs in, in a single day, I would probably put a much lighter binding on here, and I would recommend to most people choosing this ski to look, put a lighter binding on it. Yeah. Um, something that I did to kind of boost its stability is I just went really long. So I got the 185, yeah, um, and I actually I love skiing that 185. I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to drop down in length, even though like, yeah, that would be an alpine, a good alpine size for you. But, exactly. Yeah. Um, but no, I found that the 185 in this ski, um, it's still pretty easy to flick around, it's still super light. But I get a little stronger ski on the way back down, uh, and yeah, just having that long turn radius is super fun. Um, did have some footage on that ski. I feel like that's a good moment to point out that we don't have as much skiing footage on some of these skis. So my apology if, if you don't get to see some some action footage of skiing it. Uh, really just comes down to like how we test skis like this. We're generally right. not just doing lift laps, uh, yeah. which is the most efficient time to film. So. Not to mention the lack of demo binding capability on these. So if we're yeah. skiing them, they're probably our own personal pair or someone who shares a boot size. Yep, every once in a while we'll have a, a dealer throw a, a demo alpine binding on a ski like this. Like I'm pretty sure I skied that with a demo alpine binding on it. But anyways, our apologies <laughs> if, if this is less less entertaining due to a, a lack of skiing footage. Oh well, next up we got a vocal, uh, what is this, the Rise Beyond 96? You know, they say that the 
the rise above is the 88, so this one is the 96, the rise beyond. Um, and, you know, again, occupying that slot in Vocal's touring catalog, uh, they use their multi-layer touring wood core in here. So a blend of lightweight, wider stringers on the side. They do have ash underfoot, uh, as well as a binding mounting platform in here as well. So <clears throat> there is some burlier wood in here. It is a fully cap ski. I don't think we've seen a fully cap ski yet. We've had vertical sidewalls. Um, but the cap's a good way to be able to thin the sides uh, without losing really any stability. The cap does a nice job keeping this as a cohesive unit. Uh, real lack of taper in this ski. You know, some of these are a little bit more obvious than others uh, in terms of their taper. This one is not um, very much blunted to the end. Uh, and kind of a similar, we kind of said this is a similar shape to like the M6 mantra. Yeah, um, I th it's, a, it's a touring mantra. Yeah, touring mantra. I don't mantra. think Vocal like intended it to be a touring yeah. mantra, but in a lot of ways it is. The shape is very similar and, and the, the use of 3D radius is very similar yeah. too. And this is one of the skis that I thought of when, when talking about the, uh, the zero G over there. And, and that's, a, I think, a 15 meter radius underfoot. Yeah, a little shorter. So going to, you know. It's totally skiing style preference, whether you prefer that longer radius that'll allow for more like drifty turns yep. or, or a tighter ski that will give you like a more traditional responsive kind of rounder turn, right. so to speak. 1260, our scale is saying this is the 170, so a little bit shorter. Yeah, I feel like this is a good time to point out like our scale is going to probably have a, a give or take yeah. 20 to 30 <laughs> grams on it. Um, essentially the same weight as, as this yeah. zero G and very, very similar to the first ski we looked at too. Yeah. And just a great option again for this lighter binding, you know, yeah. I don't think we're quite in the, in the kingpin, uh, although you could, you know, it really depends on whether you want uh, this heel holding you in or this heel holding you in. Yep. A lot of it has to do with confidence and just the way that you want your binding to feel. Yeah, if I think you're... most people would put a marker alpinist on that yeah. as a brand matching binding. Yep, yeah, I think that's kind of what they're going for there. But, you know, nice just overall ski with, you know, I would say one of the softer flexes uh, just due to the lack of carbon in this one. Yep. Uh, but you had mentioned 3D radius and that's just a good way to introduce, um, you know, Vocal's existing technology into this ski. Um, by saying, hey, you know, we've got this great turn turn shape that we use in other skis. We're going to put it in our touring ski and everyone's going to be better for it. Yep. But definitely one of the flatter tails we've seen too. Um, some of those other ones do have a little bit of rocker to them. Uh, this is about as flat a tail as we're going to see on this. Yeah. So, I, you know, I said traditional, I think already, but I do think that ski is going to give you a, a relatively traditional feel. Yeah. Um, where especially as we move to that side of the sign, then we're gonna start to see some more progressive shapes and yep. stuff like this. This feels like a very straightforward traditional ski, which is certainly not a bad thing. Um, probably a very, very, very good choice if you're more of a resort tourer. Yep. You know, you, you go up groomed slopes in the morning just to get some exercise and, and come back down. Very efficient and works really good for terrain like that. Not to say that you couldn't take it off trail, um, but that is a, a growing segment of skiers that I think would would enjoy that yeah. ski quite a bit. Um, next up is the Atomic Backland 100. Uh, this ski has been getting a lot of attention recently, I think partly because of the introduction of the Maverick skis. Mm -hmm. Now we have Maverick 100, we've got Ben Chetler 100 obviously, and we've got Backland 100. So Atomic has three skis similar shapes and they're all in that yeah. 100 millimeter width range. This is the lightest by quite a bit, 1330 grams, you know, hovering around, maybe I saw it flash up to 1350 for a moment there. Um, this ski starts to use some carbon stringers in it. Yep. So I believe this is an ultra power wood core still in Atomic, Atomic's construction, um, relatively thin core profile. You know, I think that's especially noticeable in the tips and tails helps them keep the weight down and then we actually get this little window in the skis uh, in the skis graphic where you can see those carbon stringers coming through. Um, the first time I skied this was a 100% alpine application. Uh, I was at a on snow demo, I believe it was Waterville Valley and our awesome atomic rep, rep Bruce 
kept kind of grabbing my jacket and was like, you need to ski these, you yep. need to ski these, you need to ski these. And I'm pretty sure it was the last ski that I skied because I was kind of just like, okay, I don't want to, but like, I'll try and get to yep. it, one of those things. It really impressed me. Um, it's a pretty darn strong ski. You know, I think it, it comes through uh, in how it feels. It's certainly not the stiffest ski up here, but I think with the use of carbon, um, it just gives it a little bit more stability, a little bit more responsive than you know, some of the, I'd say all the skis that we've looked at so far. A little heavier, but you know, yeah. that's kind of the, the trade-off there. Um, very, very energetic, very snappy. You get Horizon Tech up here in the tip. Um, so pretty versatile for different snow conditions. It's gonna float really well. Um, and it feels weird to say this because we've kind of said the opposite on some of those skis, but I do feel like this one's something that you could put a shift on. I, would, I wouldn't hesitate to put a regular Alpine binding That's on That's what thing. I mean. It, yeah. it just skis so good yep. as a regular Alpine ski that, like, yeah, you could use this as a 50-50 ski. Yeah. Even though its weight kind of puts it over here with, like, I wouldn't describe any of these first three skis as 50-50 skis, but something about the way this ski performs, it, it does feel like a very versatile ski that you could use for a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, 100%, you know, and that's that was my initial impression too, is um, I don't really think this one belongs <laughs> so much in the backcountry um, part of the catalog, you know. It's yeah, just, it's just it, hard to ignore with the weight. Yeah, I know, it's really just the weight putting it there, but the performance and the character of this ski, I think, Put it in that different in that yeah. different category, and that's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Totally. Yeah. No, it's just interesting, like brand to brand, kind of how these yep. things fall. It's not it's not so black and white all the time. It's not just like cut and dry by by weight. Yeah. Um, and I think that's like, I think kudos to Atomic too, is that they've figured out how to produce these skis in in a little bit lighter way than a lot of their competitors. Yep. And you see it in the Mavericks too. You know, there's two sheets of metal in those skis, but they're like 1,800 grams. Right. So, I don't know. just impressive stuff it from Atomic. Cool. <laughs> um, next ski is the Wayback 96, and we get a, a new material in these skis compared to what we've looked at so far. Yeah, this is our first glimpse into the use of metal in these skis. So we've had carbon, we've had some polyurethane material. Uh, now we're getting uh, our first look into metal. So just a, car, a metal spine running up and down the ski here. Uh, really does a nice job with kind of stabilizing the flex, uh, making it not too chattery. And, you know, other than the, than this little skin hole, you know, it's a pretty quiet ski. It, it rattles a bit with totally. that. Totally. Similar that skin weight to there. the backland. Yep. 1350, we'll call it. This one to me feels very snappy and energetic. Those yep. feel damper and smoother. Yeah, they use carbon stringers as well. So it's basically a similar construction to that atomic, just with that metal, uh, with that metal underfoot and through. Um, we do get more of a 50-50 cap to sidewall construction on this one. So cap on top, that's gonna keep things nice and tight up here. And then that sidewall is gonna give you the grip. So 96 millimeters underfoot in this way back here. Uh, and just like, you know, a nice option for general touring use. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, there's nothing that really stands out about this ski other than the fact that it does have metal in it. Um, but really just a, a good lightweight touring ski with an, a unique feel so far. Yeah, I feel like it's got a K2 feel. Yep. You know, even like it, it has metal. And I think that's a great way to introduce this feel. But I would say that even K2 skis that don't use metal like I'm thinking of the Poacher, which obviously right. is a way different ski, but even that ski, it feels pretty damp and pretty quiet. Um, so it's just it just kind of comes down to the materials that they use and, and the way that K2 builds skis. Um, this is my brother's favorite touring ski. Yep. Uh, my brother is like a huge touring enthusiast, has been as long as I can remember. When we were kids, he was skiing like leather boot cross country skis with full metal edges on his skis. And you know now he's now, thankfully, ski companies make more appropriate, right. <laughs> more fun equipment. Um, but this is his choice, so I, that always kind of sticks out in my mind as, you know, he's my my closest relative who's yep. a, a really serious alpine touring enthusiast. And if he chooses the way back, then like that, you know, that makes me feel good yeah. about about its performance <laughs> that he trusts it. 
and like a bunch of other K2s that we've seen like in their Mindbender line, a pretty lower start to the rocker profile. I think that's yep. kind of a, a characteristic of K2 and that carries through to their touring stuff, which is great. Yeah, and similar to the vocal, you know, that in some ways that feels like a, a touring Mindbender 99. Right. Yep. Similar so, characteristics. Yeah, agree. Okay, next ski up here is the Kessley TX93. Um, super fun having a Kessley up here. Uh, like we said at the beginning, you know, some of the FX skis I think you could tour on too, yep. but these are really their, their touring specific skis. Um, pretty cool construction in these skis. It's a blend of Polonia and Beach, and then we get that carbon and fiberglass sock. Yeah. So like a sleeve that's wrapping kind of the central portion of the ski. Um, first one over 1400 grams uh, and I think like the feels like a cop out saying this because we say this about every every Kessley but the Kessley quality really comes through on yeah. these you know something about the Kessley skis the way that they're built uh, just excellent refinement and I would say this feels like a very very precise ski very responsive out of the tail very strong performance overall. Um, you know, when we started this this video, we, we talked about how you're going to see a lot of, of flatter tails in this category. That's a pretty darn flat tail there. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, even kind of squared off a little bit too. It's not like we're getting any taper back there by any means. Um, 18 meter turn radius, and then you can see longer tip rocker up there, and it's paired with Kessley's touring version of their hollow tech yeah so even lighter up there in in the tip uh, which just makes it a little easier to flick around um, but i think you know in a lot of ways this feels very similar to the vocal and overall performance it's got more of a traditional shape you're going to get a lot of responsiveness mm -hmm. out of it uh, um, to me it's not really a 50 50 ski if i was choosing this for myself I would probably be putting something like a kingpin on it yep. um, and not really skiing it in the resort. I know we're going like, again, heavier than these, yep. so it's kind of contradictory, um, but that's what's fun about doing these comparisons is this does feel more like a touring ski. Um, so not something that I personally would put like a shift on or, or something like that. Right, no, I, I, I think you still want to go light with that one. Yeah, yeah. I do too. Um, just the way it, it feels on your feet. It feels very yeah. light and very maneuverable, and it, it feels like a true true touring ski. Um, but, yeah, more, more traditional performance, more traditional feel. A lot of responsiveness out of the mm -hmm. tail. It's not going to be a drifty ski. It's going to be something that you need to be engaged on, yeah. um, which a lot of skiers really like. So great, I think there great is, option. From yeah, Kingsley. and I think there is a little bit to mention with the taper here, just a little sure. bit of that bump out, a little bit of that lower... Uh, that wider spot of the ski is a little down lower, a little bit of a departure from what we've seen. So, you know, just to give this 93 just a little bit of a boost in the fresh snow, I think that that is going to work pretty well. So if yeah. you're stuck between that lower to mid 90s range for a touring ski, like that's something to consider. Yeah, and that, that shape in the tip is nice. You know, it kind of just helps the ski like cut through the yeah. snow a little better. Um, and also it makes it less deflective. Yeah. You know, if you have a big wide tip, especially on a ski that's this lightweight, if you hit like a frozen piece of whatever, the skis can get yeah. kind of sent off track a little bit and having that that little bit of taper up there definitely definitely helps keep the ski going where it's intended to go. Yeah, I think we're moving a little bit closer to 50-50 with this Kamex Freebird here. Totally. Um, you know, a nice, nice option here for a skier that uh, wants kind of that Black Crows feel, that traditional, uh, you know, that kind of interesting construction to it. Uh, we have a blend of Beach and Polonia in the wood core here. Uh, and then that's about it. They just shape it a little bit different like they do with a lot of their skis. Um, so 1460 grams just about here uh, in the one, what is this one, a 170, 178.2. Uh, 96 underfoot, so it's a little bit different of a shape than the regular Kamex. And like we mentioned before, uh, the tail is where we're seeing it the most. So like the on-trail Kamex, we still get that nice positive camber underfoot. Um, there is a little bit different of a tapered shape 
uh, in this one versus the Alpine, uh, but the tail is, is totally different. Um, you know, we see more of that twin tip shape with the, with the regular Camex. This one definitely is a little bit flatter. You know, just a little bit of rocker back there, but overall, uh, like Jeff was saying, if we're in a situation where uh, we need this tail to hook on to any type of sketchy or technical terrain, this is a pretty good option. Um, you know, not just on this wall, but overall. So, you know, binding pairing, I think we're kind of into that kingpin range. Totally. I think we're moving kind of beyond that tech uh, and into the kingpin and or shift. Um, and we've even seen people just mount regular alpine bindings on these. Yeah, I had see. a question just recently about whether that would be suitable for an alpine binding. Yep. Yeah, if you like lightweight skis, no reason right. it can't be. Nope, perfectly fine. Vertical <laughs> sidewall ski you know, strong through the tail with, you know, a nice softer snow presence. So really kind of moving up into that, you know, from that kingpin into the shift, I think that that's kind of where we're at uh, with the bindings. But nice, stiff, overall responsive ski. I think that Black Crows does a great job with their Freebirds. Um, you know, we could have put in a Navis and a Corvus in here. I think this one's kind of better representative of, uh, you know, that more touring specific ski. Yeah, and I think it's a very well-rounded ski. Mm -hmm. um, we brought a lot of these in this year because it's it's a great ski. Yep, um, and it can, I feel like it can it can be a few different things for different skiers, which yeah. is cool to have. Um, next ski is the Wayback 106, and gosh, we're moving up into kind of what feels like a, a substantially different width range yep. here, um, and we'll continue that as we get over on that side of the wall. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, unsurprisingly, these are heavier than the Wayback <clears throat> 96. So almost 1,500 grams in these skis, um, <clears throat> excuse me, same build as the 96. Uh, so just the extra width, you know, yeah. the extra materials in this ski, that's where that weight is coming from. Um, but wider ski, what's a wider ski for? Deeper Softer, snow. deeper snow. <laughs> um, so we kind of see the changes to the 106 compared to the 96 in that shaping. So quite a bit of tip rocker up here. Yeah. You know, that's really a, a powder ski tip right there. Yeah, we were remarking of the similarities of the Mindbender 108. You yeah. Know, we talked about the 99 with that. I think that this is almost a closer comparison I, yeah, to the I, 108. I agree 100%. Um, that 108, you know, I think back to when we did a long review of it. It's got like a really good mix of directional stability and then also like playfulness and soft snow and stuff yep. like that. And I think this is a, a great example of, of kind of the same thing, just in a lighter package. Yep. Um, not as much tail rocker back here, but more than I think anything that we've looked at so far. Yeah. So <clears throat> easily among the skis that we've looked at so far, this is going to be the best in soft snow. Um, and as we're moving up in width, I don't know if this is just a personal thing, but this is where I start to lean more towards the stronger bindings. Even if it's a lighter ski, you know, this is still pretty lightweight, but me personally, I would at least put a shift on here um, because just knowing myself and the things that I would more likely do on skis if there was soft snow, you know, when I'm yeah. skiing my zero G95s, I'm out there for exercise. I'm out there for the touring experience. On the way down, I'm probably tired because it was probably a <laughs> reasonably long tour. And I'm skiing, you know, cautiously, yeah. I think is fair to say. On something like this, I would probably take a little bit more time on the uphill with the goal of doing something sillier on the descent. Right. So... That's where I would kind of draw the line personally, but plenty of people out there that are the opposite, you know, that when they're going even powder touring, they're there for more of the experience, not to like do a switch five yeah. or a flat three off a cliff. Yeah, so. and we talk about the, like the blend of uphill efficiency versus downhill performance. And I think this is one of our first ones where we're starting to see a little bit of a difference, like, the wider ski is a little bit more difficult to have in a skin track, especially in deeper snow. Yep. But you're going to be rewarded for it on the downhill, especially in said deeper snow. Yep. 
And this one kind of goes back a little bit the other way. You know, it's funny to see how yeah, the it's huskies are kind of going back and forth with weight uh, as per width. Um, so this is the Solomon Mountain Explorer 95. Uh, so we're going back down a whole centimeter in width, uh, a little bit heavier, 15, 70 grams here in the 178, 177, I'm, there we go. Um, so 95 underfoot, you know, kind of, I would say more in line with that zero G and the, uh, the vocal in terms of it being that, you know, specific touring ski in that mid nineties range. Uh, pretty interesting construction here. So what they're doing is they're kind of pre-shaping their wood core here uh, into this three-dimensional format. Um, nice and light, easy to use, and we see this, uh, this space frame technology come, t come into play here. So they're able to use this wood in an efficient manner as opposed to just putting a, you know, a stringers together. They're molding this in a three-dimensional shape. Uh, borrowing from their Alpine line, they take their CFX material, so carbon and flax stringers running the length of the ski. Um, and then in addition, just having that full vertical sidewall underfoot uh, and then tapering into that kind of half cap construction makes kind of a lot of sense in this ski, I think. It gives it a very unique look too. Yeah, and it's Karuba <laughs> wood core. It's not, we're moving away from Polonia, so it's a little bit different of a feel. Yep. Um, and then... You know, as per the catalog, I think we're putting that tech binding on here uh, just to match brands. You know, I think you could put the kingpin. I don't think this is a shift. Um, I think we're st still sticking to that lighter end of the spectrum. Yeah. Like I said, nothing's black and white here. No. Um, so, you know, from a company like Solomon, they're saying, here's a stronger ski, yep. put a lighter binding on it, and that's going to be really your your tech touring setup yeah um <clears throat> where solomon has you know their qst skis which are right. even those are on the heavier side of the spectrum in the category in general but they're kind of solomon is saying like no more, these qsts are more appropriate with the shift right so just yeah. interesting to see how things fall and it also brings up the idea that like you're not wrong Whatever you choose to do is not wrong. Yeah. It's just what you personally want to do. Right. And and you're going to have to pay the consequences right. on one end. You right. know, it does, it's up to you which end you're going to pay the consequence on. You know, if you're going to put a Duke PT on an Enforcer 110 uh, like you have, you know, you're, right. <laughs> you're going to suffer the consequence on the way up, but you're going to be a lot stronger on the downhill. So it's... Right. It's give and take. And that's what I think is interesting about uh, this comparison in general that we don't have to deal with on the Alpine side. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm thinking back to my quiver video, which did have that silly Enforcer 110 with the Duke PT. Yeah. It also had my, my Zero G with the shift on it. And I think a couple of people in the comments said something like, you're wrong. Right. That binding doesn't go on that ski. And like, Yes, it did. <laughs> I <laughs> did it. it. Is. So yeah, there's no there's no right or wrong here. It's just it's just personal preference yeah. and, and what you're trying to create for yourself. Yep. Um, <clears throat> it's a good transition to this ski because this ski feels pretty unique among this wall. A uh, bunch of different materials in this ski, and for the first time we have some foam in this ski too. Yeah. So right in the center of the ski, I believe, there's a strip of foam. It's alternating stringers. Ah, right. So it's thin wood, foam, thin wood, foam, thin wood, foam. The ski that I was thinking of in my head, and I wanted to compare it to this as, as something else that uses a synthetic material, is the Blaze. Okay. So the Blaze yep. has that central strip of it. Fairly similar concept here. Yep. You know, that, that foam helps them bring the weight down. Um, and then we get that aerospace carbon fiber in these skis too. Yep. Um, that's key to DPS skis in general. We've talked about it before, but that aerospace grade carbon fiber, it like never breaks down. Right. So the ski is going to perform on day 5,000 the same as it did on day one, which isn't true because by day <laughs> 5,000, your edges and your base would be long yeah. gone. But the ski is going to retain consistent performance through its lifetime. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, we talk about DPS, we talk about why their skis are expensive a lot. That's pretty much the reason why. Yep. Or a big reason why is the durability. Um, about 1,520 grams in this ski. Uh, so pretty consistent with 
past few skis that we've looked at and I think the next few skis are in the same range. Really what sets this ski apart is its shape. Um, so this has the RP in its title that refers to resort powder which then refers to a 15 meter turn radius. So kind of a a major departure from like the first two skis we looked at when I said a lot of these skis will have longer turn mm -hmm. radii. This is pretty much the outlier with that 15 meter turn radius. We also get a ton of tip rocker, a ton of early taper. Um, there's less of that in the tail, but I think certainly among this this wall in this category, it's it's up there among the most taper, at least the most like drastic taper, yeah. the way it kind of juts in. So what that means is this ski skis pretty short um, and it also is extremely maneuverable. So when I think about this ski, I think about a skier who prefers shorter turns. And again, kind of going back to what we were talking about the vocal with that 15 meter radius underfoot, more rounder turns, mm -hmm. more traditional turns. So those first two skis, they can make shorter turns, but you're going to be making kind of skidding quick turns that way. These make very round, yep. smooth turns. Um, so whether it's a skiing style thing or a terrain thing, great Vermont touring ski right yeah. here. Um, good friend of ours, Shelly, she just picked up a pair of these. Oh, good for her. Yeah, yep. and it's like perfect. Per ski. Perfect. Yep. Um, she had a Whaler 112 that she had as a powder ski. And she was kind of like, I want a similar feel, but I want lighter and I want to put mm -hmm. a touring binding on it. And it was like, that's, yeah, here you go. that's as good <laughs> as it gets. Um, so really works well for somebody who likes this shape. It's almost that five point side yeah. cut shape in here. You don't really see any brands listing, listing the dimensions for five point side cut anymore. But if one was to do it, I think it would be DPS on these. Yeah, and this is our first ski to truly share uh, you know, that head-on shape yes. as the Alpine counterpart, just the regular Pagoda 100 RP. Yep. Uh, that 100 RP Alpine does have more of a turned up tail. So the profile is just a little bit at the very end, but overall this shares a mold uh, with, with its Alpine counterpart. And that's the first, that's the first that we see on this one. Yeah, and pretty similar performance too. Yeah. You know, this just isn't quite as strong. Right. I would say it's, it's uh, more prone to get deflected doesn't track quite as well as the normal Pagoda, not quite as damp, um, but not far behind. And, and given the weight savings, it's a perfectly reasonable trade-off. Yeah, they're basically substituting wood for foam in, I don't know, maybe a third of the core. Exactly. That's my guess, but yeah. Um, yeah, substituting that wood for foam and you get your weight savings and a little bit flatter of a tail for, a, for skin hooking on. All right, next up we got uh, a 2023 ski. This is fun. Um, this is the Nordica Enforcer 94 Unlimited. Uh, we did do a full review on the Unlimited series of skis as a whole. We did a preview. I'm sorry, you're correct. A preview <laughs> on the yeah, and Enforcer then, Unlimited skis. You know, full disclosure, we haven't skied these yet. Right. Um, but we still felt like they were a significant new player in this category, yeah. and they're available for purchase right now. Yep. So it would feel weird to not include them, I guess. Right. And they and you know I think that they're that this series is ultimately going to speak for itself in terms yep. of it being, you know, having that uh, touring capability, but also retaining a lot of the enforcer performance. Uh, Fifteen fifty grams, just about. This is the one seventy nine. Uh, again, we're seeing a similar mold to the regular enforcer ninety four here. Uh, we do have more of that macro block construction, so wider chunks of lightweight wood in here. Uh, and then we have the carbon stringers that go alongside of it. So very similar to what um, they use in the regular Enforcer 94s, uh, pretty much without the metal and with lighter wood. Um, we still get that nice um, that drive tip. Drive tip? That's eluding me. Uh, that's... True tip. That's Rosignol drive tip. Yeah, true tip. True, t true yeah. tip technology. True tip yes. technology. So we, the wood goes further into the... Yeah. I was just yeah, we stuck get, thinking about Rosignol. No, we get a lot of blending of these things, but... Um, Drive so, tip solution? Yeah, that's Rosignol. That's what it is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> 
at any rate, we certainly see the, that enforcer technology filter in here as well. So we're, we still have that nice maneuverable ski, uh, lighter weight, what did I say, 15, 50 grams. Uh, pretty energetic, pretty snappy. Uh, I mean, are, are we, we're putting a, a shift. I think we're in the shift range, maybe moving beyond kingpin a little bit. Yeah, I feel like there might there there are probably some skiers out there that would put a kingpin on it. Yeah, uh, partly because like look how nice that match. Yeah, that's is a real, nice match. Real nice. Um, you know, I could see like an eastern skier putting a kingpin on it and yep. using it. You know, kind of as like hybrid resort touring ski and and uh, backcountry ski. Yeah. Um, but no, I think you're right in in the sense that feels like a great shift ski could be a great Duke PT ski yeah. too, you know, for somebody that prefers that lighter feel and is going to use it in the resort and out of the resort. Yeah. And that's where that 50-50 comes in. You know, it's basically a lighter Enforcer 94. If you've ever felt like an Enforcer 94 is too heavy, this would make a fine resort ski and there's nothing yeah. wrong. It's not wrong. Right. You know, not it's, it's not. And we see the similar shaping with these Enforcers. So we have that nice longer tip rocker profile, uh, really just a smooth taper shape, really easy to initiate the turn and just great energy coming out of the tail. I mean, just the, you know, as a Enforcer 94 fan, just the ability of this shape ski to make any turn at any time in any type of conditions really just highlights the versatility of this one. Uh, and that's kind of, that's where I'm sticking to it on this is this is one of the most versatile skis on this wall uh, in terms of you know top to bottom left to right its ability to do anything on the snow so you yep. put your put your shift on it and you're good that could be your one ski for everything really feels a lot like how we described this yep. ski you know i'd say there are certainly some similarities between these two skis you're gaining a few or gaining or <laughs> however you want to think about it a um, couple hundred gram difference between them. Yeah. So you're, you are going to see a difference in feel. You know, maybe you're, you want a slightly stronger ski on the, on the downhill and you're willing to sacrifice a couple hundred grams yeah. or, or you want more of a tech binding, you go here. You want more of a 50-50 binding, you can go there. Yeah. So some yeah. things to think about. And it's, just, it's interesting how they've taken that Enforcer you know, brand within a brand and now added that tertiary brand to the brand within a brand. Yes. So, good stuff. Great skis. There's no reason why they wouldn't do that. No. And, you know, I, again, to be honest, uh, we haven't skied them yet, but I am super, super excited to get those on yeah. snow and, and see what they can do. Um, this is the Hannibal 106 from Fisher. So, gosh, going back to the Wayback 106, this is the widest ski we've looked at so far, uh, matching with the Wayback 106. This has a Polonia wood core, and then we get tri-directional <laughs> carbon fiber in here. So basically what's happening is there's longitudinal carbon stringers, and then you kind of get that cross-hatching application of yeah. carbon as well. So we talk about carbon and its, its pr properties and how it's used in a ski quite a bit. This isn't quite like three-dimensional application mm -hmm. of carbon, but I think it's really nice having it on all those different axes, yeah. so to speak. Um, it does give the ski a stronger feel. Um, pretty good mix of just you know strength and, and stiffness in this ski, but also a pretty energetic, um, pretty maneuverable feel. Um, this has become a favorite of a few people on our staff. Yeah. Marcus has a pair of these that he loves. Pretty sure, almost 100% sure that we featured them in his quiver video. Um, so, you know, something that we've we've tested quite a bit internally here. Uh, so far as that some of our staff specifically own their own. Right. Um, quite a bit of tip rocker up here. You know, 106 underfoot, we're really talking soft snow in this ski. So having that tip rocker really helps boost float keep the ski planing on top of the snow, not kind of sinking in and getting bogged down. Um, not as much tail rocker on this Hannibal as we saw on the Wayback 106. So a little bit more responsiveness out of this ski, not quite as drifty, um, but very, very strong ski. And then 22 meter turn radius on this ski too. Yeah, so pretty straight cut. Pretty straight cut. Um, that's kind of, counteracting for the the lack of 
tail rocker, yeah. so to speak. You know, it's not going to feel catchy. Um, I can't recall exactly what the turn radius was on the way back. Also 22. So, you know, kind of interesting to see how those how those skis fall on similar turn radii, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's not by accident. Yeah, and kind of a ranger looking shovel to that ski yeah and um, we get we i kind of forgot to mention but we also get aero shape and we get air tech core yep. too so those couple other couple other things that we also see on the ranger side that trickle into the skis construction yeah the air tech is actually borrowed from nordic um where sure, they're milling yes. out from yep. underneath the, the core yeah with you know removes wood but it doesn't take away from the stiffness of the ski so it's a pretty interesting way of yeah you know right. Fisher's got a strong Alpine race heritage. They've got strong Nordic race heritage, too. So you'd think yep. they'd be able to build a pretty good touring ski. Right, you just mush them together. Right in between. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, great ski. Um, and there's a narrower Hannibal, too. There's a yep. Hannibal 96. So kind of similar to, uh, where is it over there? The Zero G 105 that we're going to look at in a few skis um, compared to this 95 back here. So there is a... A Hannibal 95 that yeah. would have fallen fallen over here. Yeah, it's amazing we're seeing that that trend now in the touring world with you know that Wayback series and there's more Waybacks and there's more TXs and there's different Freebirds, right? Um, and there's different uh, Ripstick tours. Yeah, you know, so we're seeing this pop up in the in the touring world as well, just kind of emphasizing not just the growth of this arm of skiing, but also just you know, consumer demand. Yep. So it's pretty interesting to see how that all works. At yeah, 10 years ago, like none of these skis existed. Right. No, it's a, it's a quick growing, uh, you know, application inside of the sport for sure. Yep. Uh, now into the future. We got another 2023 model. Uh, this is the Elan Ripstick Tour 104. Uh, we're just north of 1550 grams, really similar to this 106. Uh, this is the 180, uh, and this is, you know, this was made in collaboration with Glenn Plake. He was very much interested in, you know, basically having his favorite ripstick, the 106, made more into a touring version. So yep. uh, thus this ski is born. Um, we get some interesting construction applications to it. We start with just their lighter weight wood core, uh, and then we get their carbon bridge. So we have talked ad nauseum about the carbon tubes that Elan uses in their ripstick line. This is a little bit of a departure, so new stuff for us to talk about, which is interesting. Uh, so instead of two rods on the side, uh, we get one that runs through the middle. You can see it bumping up here. As the core gets thicker in the middle, it kind of recesses back in and then bumps out through the tail of the ski. So that carbon bridge uh, really does most of the heavy lifting in terms of the longitudinal stiffness. You know, when we talk about the regular rip sticks in those tubes, we talk about how they affect the torsional flex. Uh, this one doesn't do that so much. It's more so on this side. But since it's a tube or a rod, it still has that 360 degree capability. So as opposed to just a vertical strip, having that rod in there does affect it. And so without using you know, the double rods, I think this is a pretty, uh, a pretty clear and stark difference over the regular ripstick skis. Uh, but we have the similar overall like fun profile, you know, and that's coming straight from uh, Glenn Plake himself. Um, probably more of a turned up tail, I would yeah, say. Yeah, if you want this one, yeah. um, just to compare, because I was going to show that if you didn't, it does have, mm, I think, more tail rocker than anything we've looked at so far and almost a symmetrical rocker profile it is extremely they... interesting how close the tail rocker length is to the tip rocker yeah. Um, so yeah even compared to this way back i think a little longer in that in that ripstick tour yeah so that's gonna just give you more playfulness in the soft snow easier to release more smeary more drifty and long turn radius too and another long turn radius ski what do we got on this 23. one 23 23 in the 180 i think so pretty cool could be wrong could be 24. um still amphibio we are right and left specific on this one um it's not built in uh in the construction wise it's more in the rocker wise in, in the rocker aspect of it so it's uh similarly constructed just differently profiled 
Yep. So pretty interesting stuff coming out of a line from with this ski here. Yeah, and this is an interesting one because um, I think. I think I'd even probably put money on it. I think Glenn Plake has a tech binding on his. Okay. Um, I'm going to get a pair. It might actually be this pair that we're wearing. Right. <laughs> um, and I'm going to put a shift binding on it. Yeah. Because it feels like a ski that, that is going to want to be skied pretty hard. Yeah. Or at least I want to ski it pretty hard. Um, so, yeah, I think the, sh the shift feels like a great choice for this. Um, Duke PT-16 could work, although it feels like it's getting a little heavy. I think if I was Duke... Duke PT, I'd go Duke PT 12 on yeah. this ski. I mean, the way I think about it is if I'm going to put a Duke on something, I'm going to ride the lift with it as well. Yeah. And I don't exactly get the feeling with this ski, uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm wrong. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I'm going to ride the lift on it All right. a little bit. Um, you know, I'll, I have a heavier, I'm thinking, thinking about like kind of mid moderate powder day tree skiing. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I'll definitely take this out from from time to time on a lift service day. Yep. Just see how it does. Keep my legs a little fresher. You know, a little lighter. Yep. A little lighter on the feet. <laughs> um, so, no, I, very very cool ski and super excited to put that one to the test. Um, this is a new ski for 2022. We're pretty excited when Liberty told us about this ski. Um, this is the Origin 106 BC. So they basically took their existing Origin collection and just lightened it up a little bit. So this ski, when you put it down there, I saw 1600 something. And yeah, now we're leveling off right around 1600 grams. Yeah. So a little bit heavier than that Plake ski. Still pretty darn lightweight. You know, right. we're, we're still in a, a, in the grand scheme of things, 1600 grams for a ski that's, what length is this? Gotta be close to 180. Um, 176. 176, that's 106 under foot, that's only 1,600 grams is, yeah. is pretty darn good. Um, Aspen wood core in this ski, and then we get some carbon layers as well. Um, Liberty is kind of, I'd say as a company, they're traditionally known for making twin tips. Um, they've kind of gotten away from that a little bit in recent years, but I do think the company's heritage comes through in this ski's shape. So a lot of tip rocker there. You know, that reminds me a lot of that Hannibal and the amount of tip rocker it has, but more splay back here and, and longer tail rocker than that Hannibal. Yeah. Um, so, you know, more consistent with that ripstick that we just looked at, or maybe even a little bit longer. Um, so this is going to have a more centered, more balanced feel than I think a lot of people would expect out of this category in general. It's not a twin tip, but if you're the type of skier that wants a ski that feels more balanced, I yeah. think this is a great choice. Um, really good mix, again, of, of being pretty lightweight, but also strong. You know, you could ski this hard and aggressively and fast and, and not worry about a lack of stability or anything like that. Um, like we were saying, you know, I, I think we're beyond kingpin here. Yep. You know, I think there are probably some skiers out there that would disagree that really, really trust bindings like that or, or maybe don't push a ski too, too hard. Um, but this feels like a great 50-50 in and out of yep. bounds ski. Um, easy tail release, a lot of uh, a lot of drifty performance in how it skis, um, but an 18 meter turn radius in this ski, so a little tighter, uh, which should make it a little bit more responsive if you happen to take it into tight trees and stuff like that. I think the thing that sticks out to me about this one is that they actually use the term backcountry. Yeah. Whereas I think that's the only one that does it. Yeah, and, others use tour, right, but the this specifically tour. says backcountry. Right, which I just, I just found that to be interesting because that's kind of what this segment was before touring was yeah. invented. It right. was backcountry skiing. Right. And I think that that speaks to Liberty's uh, you know, branding and their customer base is that they're a free ride ski company yeah. and I see them out in the backcountry. Yeah, they're not really designing these for somebody who's touring inbounds at a resort, right. going up groomed trails. They're yeah. they're designing this for somebody in the Colorado, Utah backcountry that's yeah. you know touring to ski a technical line 
or going to go build a backcountry jump somewhere. Yeah. You know, that's the company's history, and that's the intention of this ski. Yeah, I thought that was noteworthy for sure when we were putting this together and doing the write-up was, this is the only one that actually says backcountry on it. And I like that. Yeah. <laughs> We have a wider zero G. A uh, lot of the same things that we said about the 95 are gonna carry right through to this 105. Uh, this is the longer one, the 188. So, you know, it might've been on the other side of the Liberty if it was in the shorter length. Yeah, it wouldn't, at least wouldn't be as far apart from its narrower yeah. sibling over here. Yeah, those K K2s are, have a tighter spread. Uh, they're the same, same length. Yes. 1640-ish uh, on the scale. Again, we got the Carbon Drive 2.0, so we do have a three-dimensional application of carbon and that uh, additional carbon underfoot for binding mounting really kind of holds the ski in nice. 24-meter uh, turn radius, so straight cut. Uh, and like that 95, we have a Blizzard-specific skin fixation. And we haven't really touched on that, but you know, kind of depends on whether the company has, has a skin or not. I mean, Fisher makes a skin, Elan makes a skin. K2, Blizzard, um, so they're all, you can now get that trim to, uh, not even trim to fit, the yeah, pre-trimmed, uh, the pre-trimmed, that's what I meant. Already fit. You can buy the 0G 105 188 skin and it just clips in and you're off. Yep. So that's a nice thing, something to keep in mind. You know, it's not terribly difficult to trim your own skins, but if the company makes it, then why not get it? Yep. You know, it's, it exists for a reason. And we do see more rocker in this ski than in that 95. So a little bit lower, a little bit more splay. See it in the taper as well, just a lower uh, lower wide point. Yeah, and you see it in the tail, definitely. Very much difference in the tail on this one. If you're, if you're in that zero G mode and you're looking for more soft snow performance, uh, both from a flotation and a playfulness perspective, uh, this is gonna be your better bet versus the 95 and just really makes for that, you know, better, deeper snow performance. So again, it's great that these companies are making these multiple width skis because not everyone has the same application out there. It's just, it's, it's based on what you're doing, what you wanna do and what you set out to do. So that's where something like this really comes in handy. Uh, and like that 95, it's pretty stiff, sure. you know, yeah. and it's actually consistently stiff. Um, for have for being as big as it is and as light as it is, uh, just surprisingly stiff and responsive. So, great energy out of this one. Ton of similarities between that ski and the Hannibal 106. Yep. And how they feel, you know, they both like strike that balance between precision, but then like soft snow, drifty powder performance. Yep. And I think it's really cool. Yeah. Um, it's another one that that a few people on our staff have in their quiver, and love them. Yeah, I mean, it's just a no-brainer. It's an easy ski, well-made, does a lot of things really well. Yep. Okay, next ski we have another vocal. We actually have three vocals on this wall. Um, this is the Mantra V-Works. Uh, so pretty interesting ski, very interesting construction. We've talked about these V-Works skis quite a bit before. Um, it uses a multi-layer Tor wood core, so kind of a lighter version of Vocal's multi-layer wood core. Similar to how Fisher does it, they mill out some kind of air channels yep. through that core. And then we get 3D Ridge. Um, 3D Ridge is a construction that we see in uh, Deacon's. Deacon, yeah. Um, I guess it originally came from the RTMs, yep. I'm pretty sure. Um, so 3D Ridge, and then we also get Titanal Band. So Titanal Band is all but gone from the vocal line with the exception of these V-Works skis. So Titanal Band was introduced with the Confession as well as the Kanjo and it's basically, as you yep. would guess, a <laughs> band of, of Titanal metal kind of through the center of the ski. So moving up quite a bit in weight here, um, 1660 grams. This is starting to feel like a great Duke PT ski. Mm -hmm. um, they're, couple people in our staff, including one of our owners, I believe has a pair of these just with an Alpine binding on yep. it. So this is, you know, we're certainly getting to a range here. I feel like that zero G was kind of the last ski where like touring specific 
yeah. where the la the remainder of these skis, like you could put an alpine binding on right. here. And this is also where we're kind of like we're crossing over into skis like the Vocal Blaze and stuff like yep. that. Like we're in the same width range as a lot of other skis that we've talked about before. Um, so this ski kind of takes the idea of the mantra um, and repackages it into a lighter ski. And when I say the idea of the mantra, I really mean that in kind of like a vague way. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know the mantra is intended to be a versatile and performance-oriented all-mountain ski. This is too, but the shape is quite a bit different. I mean, it's almost more like the '98 that used to exist, and we kind of see or that. Or even the reverse camera 100. And that comes. Oh, you mean the ski the '98? The '98. Yes. And then this with the 108, the Katana V Works. Yep. But I would say more in common with a 98 than an actual mantra. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Um, so not much camber underfoot. Very, very long but low rise mm -hmm. tip rocker, which is something that we've grown accustomed to seeing from vocal again back there in the tail. Long, low rise rocker. Um, 20.8 meter turn radius in these skis. You're going to get a really, really nice blend of precision you know this is an extremely torsionally stiff ski uh, it's a pretty stiff longitudinal flex as well certainly not the stiffest ski up here but still very supportive but then having that long rocker is going to give you really yeah. easy edge release um, i know that's why our owner that owns a pair of this ski he really likes them because he uses them as like his stow wood ski yeah. with that long rocker profile you get a nice forgiving maneuverable feel but it's not like there's so much splay that its ski is short so right. it's still a confidence inspiring ski um, and that comes in handy both in the resort and like we were saying deep in the backcountry if you need edge grip if you're traversing over a 600 foot cliff or something like that you want good contact to the snow you don't want a ton of rocker splay um, a little bit more of a price tag on these skis too yeah. than some of the things up here but it's really just coming from all the technology in these skis. Yeah, a lot of carbon, and we see it in a 3D form as well. So it's whenever they're bending that carbon or angling that carbon, we're getting another level of stiffness and responsiveness. Yeah, and something that never ceases to amaze me on these V-Work skis is how thin they're able to taper the, the core yeah. as you reach the edge. It just feels like it should break. It's unnerving. But they don't. Not that we know of. <laughs> I've never heard of one. <laughs> never, breaking, never heard of it. But no, come totally. Across. It's like you look at it and it's like that's not a ski. Yeah. But just goes to show how much technology these manufacturers have at their fingertips these days. Yeah, a lot of faith in that thinner sidewall. Not so much a problem with this ski here. Uh, glad we were able to get a Stokely on the wall. Um, this is the Edge FT. Uh, it's 94 millimeters underfoot. Uh, basically, it shares a lot of similarities with the Stokely, the Nella 96. So it's kind of a blend of that Storm Rider, looking for that Storm Rider skier uh, who's looking for a lighter ski. It's like a Nella that's red. Right. <laughs> There's a few, few little differences. Uh, 1680 grams. Uh, and we do get a full sheet of metal on this ski. So similar to what we see in the Nella and Storm Rider series, that Titec top sheet, this is actually a Titec Pro top sheet. So it's even a burlier metal. They do use the super light wood core, which is found in the Nella. And then they also use their uh, ultra light metal edges. So the, the edges alone are 25% lighter than the normal uh, metal edges found in the Alpine version. So they're saving weight in the wood core and in the edges. Uh, but that's pretty much it. You know, they use this different dusting on the top sheet, which is pretty interesting. So it's a smoother, uh, you know, smoother feel to it. It's going to shed the snow more, yep. um, similar to like these ice off top sheets uh, on the vocals. Yeah, and we had, I don't think we even mentioned it, um, but K2 has a treatment to their top sheet. Yeah. A couple other brands have have similar treatments to your, their top sheets, so right. you're not getting snow sticking on there. Yeah. There's a reason why like not a lot of touring skis are just like jet black. Right. Yeah, and, it, and I mean, fact. who wants to lug snow up the hill? You know, it's hard enough. Yeah. Um, but the this, this shape and the profile is very much similar to 
what we see in the Storm Rider line um, with a little bit of tip rocker, not a whole lot. You know, Stokely kind of as a company trends towards the non-rockered, uh, you know, definitely more directional type of ski. So a little bit of tip rocker and then a very flat tail from just like what we've seen before in the past uh, with, you know, minimal to zero taper. So really just true edge, edge contact uh, from tip to tail. Uh, with that metal laminate up top makes this uh, one of the smoother performers uh, on this wall for sure. It feels like a heavier, more damp version of these. Yeah, I would say that this has a, a more consistent flex too. Yeah. Um, you know, you definitely see a little bit more of the bend thanks to that hollow tech. Right. Uh, we don't really get that with the Stokely here. Uh, very, very consistent from tip to tail. Not surprising that these two brands would be kind of competitors in this category. Yep. But it is it is interesting to see the similarities in the shape. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think that that just matches the brands. Yeah. And, and when you basically are, you know, going back to weight, you're moving up a lot in weight from this ski to that ski. So you get more vibration damping and a more powerful feel. Yep. But you know, you're less efficient on the uphill. So it's. Right, there's it's your give and to take. The, the decision making yep. process. Um, binding, I mean, pick your poison, I guess. You know, anywhere from Kingpin to Alpine. I think you could put anything on this. You know, if you're similar to the Enforcer, if you're just looking for a lighter version of a Storm Rider, here's your ski. You yeah. know, feel free to. <clears throat> it just ends up in the touring side of Stokely's catalog, and it's a really, uh, really well made. Your, your, that price tag exists on this ski as well. Um, like we've talked about with the Kessleys, the the quality is there. You know, that's what you're paying for. Yep. So pretty cool stuff. Um, next ski is another one that we talked about recently in the launch of the Enforcer Unlimited collection. This is the Enforcer Unlimited 104. If you haven't seen that video, go watch that video because we do talk at length about their construction and all that kind of stuff. Um, We've fielded a lot of questions in the past few years of people saying, can I tour on an Enforcer 104? And the answer has always been, you can do whatever you <laughs> yeah, want. Sure. Um, they're heavier skis. You know, I think the Enforcer 104, maybe not in this length, but at least in the 186 length, it's like over 2,200 grams. Yeah. So it's a pretty heavy ski. Um, this one comes in at 1,700 grams. So 500 gram difference between those two skis but the shape is the same. Yeah. Um, the construction, we're using the same construction that Bob described in the 94 there. So uh, this ski is relying on carbon because they took the metal out. And this is something we talked about in the preview video for these skis. Um, there's kind of two different sets of carbon stringers in this ski. One of them, I don't remember the names, but there is more carbon in this ski. Yeah. This is, that's the easiest way I can describe it, or denser application of carbon. Um, so they're kind of boosting the ski's performance through carbon. Um, still a pretty strong flex pattern. You know, that Enforcer 104 is a strong ski, and I feel like if this wasn't a strong ski, it just wouldn't feel like an enforcer. Right. You know, they're all they all have to at least hit a at least a a, a benchmark of stability and power and stuff like that. Um, we've looked at quite a few skis that use long tail rockers. So kind of starting with this Wayback 106, the Hannibal, the Plake Ski, the Origin BC, even that Zero G. This, on the other hand, is kind of the first one that feels more like a twin tip. Yeah. So there is long rocker back here still, but the amount of splay is more significant compared to most skis that we've seen. Now there's kind of a reason why you don't see a lot of twin tip touring skis when you have a rounded tail the skins just fall off yep. i've had a lot of twin tips that i've used as touring skis and you look behind you halfway up your tour or after 15 feet sometimes and your skin is just flapping around back there the way that nordic kind of hacked this off and put that flat skin attachment point is allowing you to have a twin tip shape that's going to work really well as a touring ski um, so whether you're using this as a true alpine touring ski um, or whether you're just putting an alpine binding on it, this is just a lightweight Enforcer 104, yep. which 
think there's going to be a lot to like here. I I agree. Yeah, um, yeah this 100%. is a pretty exciting ski, just like that plate ski too. I think there's going to be a lot to like there too. They do have different shapes, and I think that's going to come through in their performance and their feel. So you know, differing quite a bit from that plate ski. This has a 17 and a half meter turn radius, so it's going to have more of that quick round shape of your turn rather than like a a drifty, a long drifty turn, although you can still make really drifty turns on these. Um, but yeah, you know, all the benefits of the enforcer shape, so you get nice maneuverability when you keep it flat, but then long effective edge when you tip it on edge, but it's 500 grams lighter. Yeah. So this is going to be a great, great ski. Can't wait to test these. I certainly wouldn't be surprised if you end up seeing a lot of these without Alpine touring bindings. Yeah, I think that there's certainly a market for that. And just as we say that you wouldn't want to ride a lift with some of those skis on the left, maybe you wouldn't want to ski uphill with some of these skis. And I think that that's... Yeah, it's, it's just personal preference, yep. really. You but know. it's interesting to see that there's such a gap within 15 models. Totally. You know, on, on a wall that you can use one exclusively for touring and one never for touring. Yeah, right. Um, not to say this is bad at touring, right. but... Yeah, you could use this as just a 100% inbounds resort ski. Yep. You know, if you're like, we get a fair amount of people that say they're, you know, 140 pounds or stuff, something like that, and not particularly aggressive, but love the look of the Enforcer 104, I think this is probably going to be a better choice for them right. than the ski with two sheets of metal. So, yeah. great, great addition. Yeah, Su yeah, the, whole, to the have whole line, it. you know, and this, you know, like you said, I think we're going to get a lot of traction on this one. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, this one's an interesting one. Um, you know, kind of like how this Mantra V works. Uh, kind of blurred that line between a Mantra and a 98. I think this one, you know, takes that Katana mentality, blurs it with the outgoing 108, 108, which I know you liked. You liked that 108. I liked the 108. I think I was like one of, one of 10 50 people. <laughs> people that liked it that I talked to. Yeah. Yeah, kind of a love-hate, I think, you know, and that relied on this 3D ridge as well. Uh, 1870 grams here. This is the 179, I think. Yeah, almost 177. A, almost a 200 gram increase from that enforcer. Yeah, so we're we're getting up there. Um, this one again has that uh, lighter touring core with those sections milled out of the bottom, similar to that Hannibal. Are you flexing that and grunting? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so it has that multi-layer wood core, really nice, you know, 3D carbon uh, ridge to it. So we have carbon in that multi-dimensional uh, application, so it gives it that stiffness and responsiveness. Uh, this is our widest ski on the wall, 112 underfoot. Yep. Um, this next one, the Ferrex is 110, um, so we are getting flotation from width. Uh, we are also going to see it from Rocker. Uh, this is our only ski on the wall and like one of two skis I can think of in this whole warehouse that are full Rocker. So we're, we get that prime driftiness out of this one. So nothing, no camber underfoot whatsoever. Um, this one with the, the width combined with that full Rocker shape profile, excuse me, will make this one uh, the floatiest ski on the wall. Remember kind when of, all of vocal skis were reverse camber? Yes. That was weird. That was a weird time. But <laughs> weird time to be alive. <laughs> weird time to be a skier. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, there it is. It's just that full, long, low rocker profile, you know, minimal splits. I think people's big hang up on full rocker was they were hard to hold yeah, hard together. Hard to hold like together. This. <laughs> totally. And then low, you know, there's nothing like dramatic about it like we saw in this 104. Um, you know, but yet it's still getting that drifty, playful uh, mentality because of that profile. Probably like pr practically the best directional powder ski you can think of. Right. Or I mean, it, at least in a touring application, like a relatively light ski, like this thing's going to be a blast in powder. Yeah. Big, this is your big mountain alpine touring ski, your yeah. big mountain backcountry ski. Yeah. This is what you're putting... The Duke PT on, I mean, you could put a shift, you could put a kingpin on there, it's yeah, fine. Yeah, just go Duke PT Duke 16. PT, I would just put a Pivot 18 on it and put it on my backpack and call it a day. Boot pack? Yeah. 
Why not? Sure. Personal um, preference. Remember, Bob, there's nothing wrong. No wrong. Yeah. But at any rate, it does have that really sound overall stability to it because of this and then that drifty mentality uh, because of the full rocker. So yep. pretty interesting ski to see, you know, on this on this wall and uh, certainly, you know, because it falls into that tour category, uh, you know, that needs to be addressed. Totally. Again, yep. you know, these are all skis that fit into the manufacturer's categorization of touring skis. I think especially these last two skis or maybe like the last three or, or with the starting with the Enforcer 104, we're really crossing over into like right. potentially resort skis just based on weight. There um, are much lighter alpine skis. Exactly. That's exactly than, what I mean. Than this. Yep. Um, so this is the Black Crows Ferrex Freebird. This ski is over 2,000 grams, so 2,020 grams. So like you just said, there are a lot of skis in this same width range that are lighter than this. Right. I don't think Head makes a ski that's heavier than this. They, like every Elan is lighter than this. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of choices out there that are lighter than this, but Black Crows put this, puts this into their touring category, and we'll talk about why, because this is a pretty unique ski. Um, cool combination of elements in this ski, Poplar, Polonia, Isocore, mm -hmm. uh, which is like a, a carbon mousse thing. Yeah. It's really hard to describe. Kind of just a synthetic material. Yeah, but they use the word moose in their catalog. Yeah, not moose the animal, moose no, like the hair with two product. S's. Yeah, and the <laughs> U. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then we get H-shaped carbon in this ski, and it's actually kind of built into the core, too. Yeah. The core itself has some H-shape to it. So we see that H-shaped metal on the Justice and the Orb and the Serpo mm -hmm. and the Divus. Divus. Um, this is a very similar concept, but it's not metal, it's carbon in the core itself. Um, going back to that Enforcer 104, how we mentioned, like, there aren't really many touring skis that are twin tips because twin tips don't work as skin attachment. Um, this is one of those skis that contradicts that. So Black Crows basically set out to make a powder twin tip touring ski because there aren't many of them. Uh, so you can see the twin tip shape back there and then they just take a hacksaw. I don't think that's actually what they do. But it looks like they just take a saw and hack off the end of the ski and put a skin attachment point back there. Um, 21 meter turn radius, like Bob said, it's 110 underfoot. There's not like a crazy amount of rocker in this ski, um, just kind of enough. You know, you're, you're getting that float, you're getting a little bit easier edge release, stuff like that. Um, this is a great tool if you need a twin tip and you need something really wide. But yep. you're also heading out into the backcountry. You know, you don't want to go super, super heavy. Um, I'm thinking like Black Crows athletes, maybe you're putting a shift on here or something like that. And this is kind of your, your hybrid backcountry powder and backcountry jump ski. You know, yep. That's kind of how I think of the Ferrex Freebird. Um, the other thing that I think is very important to mention is it's a pretty darn strong ski too. You know, it's not like anima strength. Right. Um, but considering the weight and the fact that it's designed for touring, I think it's uh, I think its strength is admirable and, and worth noting. Yeah, and I think that taper, especially in the shovel, is as well. Yeah, it's cool. A um, little bit lower, lines up well. The widest part is right at the end of that H, uh, the H shape for the carbon. Yep. So, you know, they took that into account where this widest part is a little bit more floaty and playful and then a bit more business-like uh, from where the that inward side cut actually starts. Yeah, and you know, to summarize, this binding doesn't really go with this ski. Are you saying it's wrong? I'm not saying it's wrong. <laughs> if, you, if you noticed, I was careful about my choice of words, but probably not the best match. Yeah. Similarly, we'll take this one. Probably not the best match. Right. Would I tell you not to do it? Not necessarily. Again, you, you're your own person. You can do whatever you want. I wouldn't recommend it. From a skiing standpoint. Right. From yeah. an objective skiing standpoint, I wouldn't recommend it. Where when we get into this more middle range, 
there's a lot of different ways you yeah. can go. And it really comes back to yourself as a skier, what you're doing, how much time you're spending going uphill, what you value in binding performance, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So hopefully this was interesting in kind of talking through the differences between some of these skis and how you might think about your binding application. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if there's something that you want to do and, and we didn't talk about it, don't don't yeah. feel completely turned <laughs> off because we didn't specifically recommend it. If you're not sure if something would work, certainly let us know. We're happy to give you our opinion, um, whether we would recommend it or not, or, or you know, whether, we, I don't think we're ever going to say like, no, don't do that. Right. Um, but if you're not sure, ask us, because I would love the opportunity to just be like, no. No, that's wrong. God, that, that, that's <laughs> wrong. You found the one that's wrong. I think the wrongest we've seen is we used to have the VTA 88s from Vocal. Yeah, which is very comparable to this. And I remember someone wanted to put a Griffin on it, and they bought skins with it. That's wrong. And we said, what are you, do what are you doing? Yeah. And they wanted to go skinning and just didn't have, you know, the, the proper education, which we were happy to provide. Like, right. No, that's not how this works. Right. You need to, you need a pivot. And so, not a pivot buying. That would also be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there, there is that person out there that is, you know, is learning and is new to the sport. And, yep. you know, we're going we're gonna to answer that question honestly. Yep. So, hope you guys enjoyed this. This was our first attempt at a touring ski comparison. It was really fun to do. Yep. And I hope there was some valuable information in there. Um, so, let us know if you have any questions. And we will see you guys out there in the backcountry. <laughs> we'll see ya.